are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about a girl who survived 104 days of kidnapping by her obsessed teacher. Now, this is an incredible survival story of a 13-year-old who had a life full of horror, only for it to become even worse than she could have imagined. With parents who betrayed her, she believed help wasn't coming. For 104 days, she became an entirely different person, the person her abductor wanted her to be. And then she was found. I also want to thank our brand partner, Pinecone, if you are interested in earning some money online from the comfort of your home while sitting on the couch, Pinecone is literally perfect. All they need from you is feedback on different products and brands and you can get gift cards as well as cash and it is invite only and so you will get rewards and you're guaranteed a payout amount for every task that you complete. You could even get the chance to test and review different products that they will send you. It's such an incredible way to make money as a teenager or if you're an adult and want a side hustle. And I have an exclusive link for you in the description for you to start earning rewards ASAP. You won't find this link anywhere else, so tap my link to start earning rewards today. Now let's get back to the story. It was 1995 in Wisconsin and the Mullenbergs lived in Stevens Point. This was Monica Burgett and her husband, Jake, which was her second husband, and her daughter, which was a 13-year-old Jessica and Jessica's two brothers. Now, Monica's first husband was the children's father and his name was Dale. They had divorced, but the children would go and see him on the weekends to get his visitation. The community at Jessica's mother's home was full of little children for the kids to go and play with. They were always at each other's homes and they had sleepovers with one another and just next door there was a little boy who was Jessica's age. So it was a beautiful place to live and in 1995 none of the parents were worried about where their children were. They knew they were outside playing with the others. Now Jessica was this really smart beautiful little girl and she was also kind of more of a tomboy. She would always wear her hair up in a ponytail. She would ride bikes around the neighborhood. She would play football. She would sell cookies to the neighbors and she was always rearing to go even if it meant just hanging out with the boys. But then her stepfather, Jake, was offered a different job and that meant that they would have to move out of town. Now Jessica was actually really excited about this. She couldn't have been happier so they packed up and they headed around 100 miles away. This was about two hours and because of the distance, the kids' visitations to their father was also pushed back to only every other weekend instead because it was a little longer of a journey to pick them up and get them back home. Now on September 17th of 1995, Jessica was visiting her father and Euclair at his trailer home, which was Cozy Acres Mobile Village. Now her father, Dale, called her mother, Monica, in a panic, claiming that Jessica had run away. Now this had actually been the day prior and he hadn't been able to locate her in that time, so he ended up calling Monica. Now Monica asked Dale where she had been, where she could have disappeared from who she was with. And this is when Dale said that she was with a dad, a single father who lived in the neighborhood, who also had a son. And this is when Monica found out the name and began to scream hysterically. Her entire body went numb. 15,000 posters were distributed nationwide all over Wisconsin, but in the states around. And a note was actually found in Jessica's father's mobile trailer, allegedly from Jessica in her handwriting, claiming that she would not return home until she was safe from someone making her do bad things there. Her mother and father believed that someone had forced her to write this and nobody was harming her there, so they said. And so it was quickly realized that Jessica didn't run away. She was believed to be abducted. Monica didn't know the extent of the man who had taken her's obsession with Jessica, but she did know that this man had been following them with the move. He ended up getting a new job with her new school as a teacher's aide, 
and put his son in her class to be closer to her. Monica felt horrible that she had allowed this man into their lives because it had all started when this man moved in next door when they were at their first home in Stevens Point. Yet no one knew that for Jessica, the abuse had begun at eight years old. This was five years prior. Everyone thought the neighbor Stephen Oliver, who had just moved in as a single father with his son and was willing to help out with the kids, was just this really nice, normal guy. They felt bad for him because he didn't have that help of a wife and the mother of his son, and so they were more than willing to help him out or to let the kids go over and play with his only child. No one questioned when these kids would go over to Stephen's home and spend the night, and so little Jessica had no one to help her when all of this began. It started out as Stephen touching her boobs and her butt during two hand touch football, and he would always come over to her and she knew that this was wrong, but as an eight-year-old, she didn't necessarily expect an adult to have ill intentions. That wasn't her first thought, and she didn't say anything. And then the longer it went on, she realized that something was very wrong, that this was a bad thing. As the sexual abuse escalated, she was then told that if she told anybody, her entire family would be killed by Steven. Jessica believed that he would kill her family because he was already doing something that she knew was wrong and he would make her say that she liked it and he would not stop until she did. She felt disgusted every time she went home but no one seemed to notice and her mother and stepfather would encourage her and her brothers to go over to the neighbors to play with the kids and they never really had the thought that something bad could happen and so they didn't check to make sure everything was okay. Steven would take them to the movies to get ice cream and the parents absolutely loved him for doing this, but Jessica was going through this horrific situation she could tell no one about. It became even worse for Jessica when this monster started at her school and she couldn't escape him even when she was trying to learn. Stephen was actually given a job as a teaching assistant working with different kids in this classroom, but he was always in Jessica's class with her, helping her, and the teacher nor the students seemed to notice because they just thought she was someone who needed some extra help with her schoolwork and they weren't really going to say anything. They were taught not to say anything to these kids who needed more help. And so he was always with her, kind of always reminding her that she couldn't speak out. And when recess began, Stephen was one of the grown-ups on the playground, helping out. And he was supposed to be there watching the kids, making sure they were safe. And instead he was cornering Jessica where no one could see them and groping her at recess as well. This 37 year old man was obsessed with this child and all Jessica wanted to do was ask for help and no one was coming to her rescue. However, her saving grace would be her stepfather's new job, an escape, a relief that had already begun setting in. And then Jessica was told by her mother, Monica, that the next door neighbors were apparently leaving as well, that Stephen Oliver and his son were gone. Now, her mother, Monica, had actually told her this to gauge her expression and her response. You see, Monica had begun not to be completely clueless of what was happening. She wasn't completely blind to the strangeness of Stephen the more she got to know him. And she began to get suspicious that Stephen had an attraction to Jessica. Yet she had no idea that Jessica was already going through what she feared was going to happen. Jessica knew it was odd that her abuser was leaving the same exact time that they were also moving out of town, but she was too grateful to even question it. Her abuse was over and she truly believed that. Unfortunately, that would not be the truth. She and her brothers had been picked up for the first time at their new home by their father, Dale, to take them back to his trailer home. And they were going to be visiting him for that weekend. And Jessica was excited. You know, she was going to get to spend some time away, see her dad, but as they pulled up to the trailer home's driveway, Stephen Oliver was standing there waiting for her. Jessica quickly realized that Stephen Oliver hadn't moved away from her as a regret for what he had done to try to get away and not be held accountable for the abuse. He had known that she was moving with her mother and he wouldn't know where their new house was located, but he did know that Jessica and her brothers went to see their father 
on the weekends and he knew where Dale lived. The Olivers had moved in directly across the street from Dale at the trailer park home, waiting for Jessica. Sadly, Jessica's father was even more lenient than her mother, and there were no rules for her or her two brothers with her step-siblings. They were able to do whatever they wanted, and when Stephen asked her father, Dale, if they could all come over and have a sleepover, he didn't mind at all. In fact, he encouraged it. There were no curfews, no one to watch out for them, and Jessica was right back where she thought she had escaped from. She was only in fifth grade when he sexually assaulted her for the first time. This was after Monica had specifically told Dale and his new wife that Stephen Oliver was what she was now realizing was a monster and that he was obsessed with their daughter. Monica told Dale to keep him away from her at all costs if he tried to come near her. She had gone to the police to a lawyer asking if they could actually get a restraining order against Stephen if, you know, so he couldn't contact Jessica again. And they ultimately told her that until something bad happened, they couldn't do a thing. They needed proof. Jessica still hadn't told a soul what had happened to her and what was happening to her. Monica had slowly just started to realize this on their own as they moved away and Stephen transferred to their new school, to Jessica and her brother's new school and became an aide there as well. He then put his own son in her class. At this point, Monica told him to stay away from him because he had tried to move in nearby her home. And once he did listen to Monica, he moved away. They thought that they were clear of him, except she didn't realize that he had just moved on to her ex-husband's home. He decided to try a different way of getting to Jessica without her in the way. And that's exactly what he was able to do. You see, Stephen had started this writing club and it was for children. It was said to be with the school and he told Dale about it saying that he wanted to enroll his children in it. It would be you know, an after school activity that he would watch the kids for them and they wouldn't have to deal with them during that time. And so Dale and his new wife said, yeah, that'd be great. The kids will be out of our hair for a little bit longer. And so they would all go to this local park and they would be given these writing assignments. They would write different stories and then afterwards, Stephen would tell the kids it was time to play hide and seek, but he would only go after the girls, specifically Jessica. At 13 years old, Jessica's father and stepmother were told by Stephen that one of Jessica's articles, her stories that she had written during this club was wanted by a publisher, that he had sent it in to the Random House Publishing and that they wanted to make it into this book. And Stephen Oliver said that he could take her to this meeting and since he was the writing club director, he would be the best person to do so and that they might be able to get her a book deal, meaning money for them. So on September 16th of 1995, they headed out and Jessica asked her father, is mom okay with this? Does she know that I'm going? And her father said, yes. But Jessica knew her mother would have never allowed this. She didn't have a choice though. She had to go. And part of her was excited. If this was true, her writing was good enough to get a book deal. At 13 years old, dreams can come true. Out of nowhere, this can happen. However, judging from Monica's reaction on the phone when Dale called her to say that her daughter was missing, Monica had no idea that her daughter was going with Steven because she would have told them no. Because that next day, no one was able to get a hold of Steven Oliver or Jessica and they still hadn't returned when this was not going to be a weekend trip. This was just going to be a one day trip and they should have been home. It was quickly found by investigators that the son that Steven had full custody of at this time was now living in that same home except with his mother, so Stephen's ex-wife. She had come in because she said that Stephen had told her that he was going to Detroit for a job and would be gone for months. Now this abduction is what investigators had told Monica to wait for in order to get a restraining order for Jessica to be in danger. However, at this point, she believed it was too late. Now, Sergeant John Volger was on this case and he followed up with a thousand tips, but nothing was uncovering their location. 
Stephen Paul Oliver was known to be this computer geek who would work at different schools assisting the teachers in English and writing. But what he was hiding about himself, his obsession with children, made the fact that he was a teacher in classrooms even more disturbing. Investigators tracked down the former owner of Steven's car and were able to get photos of the car in order to distribute. It was said to be a blue 1986 Oldsmobile Calais with the plate number NJG726. Every airport, train station, and bus station's passenger list were looked into. They were combed through and neither of their names were ever shown. Their photos were not only on flyers across the country, but they were also on the sides of different trucks that were also traveling across the country. The sergeant even admitted that they were so low on tips that they went to different psychics just hoping that they could give them something that they could go on. Then they finally had a breakthrough because Stephen's car was found in a parking garage at the Kansas City Airport. However, by then, the airport staff said that they didn't remember this man and this little girl who looked like the photographs. They didn't, they saw so many people in a day, they didn't remember who they were or where they had gone. The passenger lists were gone through from the day that they disappeared to the day that they found the car and neither of their names were found. That's when the sergeant went to America's Most Wanted for help. He went through the FBI headquarters in Washington and there he was told to wait. He knew that Jessica didn't have that time to wait though and he was talking with all the different investigators, the FBI agents working on the case, complaining about this and the fact that they needed to get her photo and her case talked about quickly. And that is when he was suddenly put in the room with producers because one of the FBI agent's daughters actually worked for the show and she pushed the case to the front of the line. He would be on the episode with 58 FBI offices on high alert for possible leads, but sadly only a couple of tips would come through, which didn't lead to Steven or Jessica, at least at first. On December 29th, 104 days of captivity later, Monica would receive a phone call. Now, she was actually on the phone with her sister, and it was just after midnight, so she kind of answered all angry, kind of just, you know, she was done with it. She had gone three and a half months without her daughter. She was in a very bad state of mind, and so she answered this phone call, and she was quite annoyed until she realized that this was an FBI agent, Jerry Southworth, and he said three words to her that would forever change her life. We got her. The FBI agent called and said that we, we, we've got her. What did you do? And I screamed. <laughs> it was just the most profound happiness I've ever felt in my life. You see, when America's Most Wanted had covered her case, it began to show again and again. And finally, they did receive a tip. This was from a motel manager who had recognized Stephen Oliver as the man staying in their hotel under a different name. He was also working at the motel as a painter to pay for the room. And this manager also claimed that a girl was with him but never left the room because he said that she was homeschooled and she was also never allowed to be out alone. Now, FBI agents rushed to the Days in Houston and the motel room was raided. And that is when they arrested Stephen Oliver and Jessica was found alive. Thankfully, she was in good condition and the next day she was rushed to the Houston Intercontinental Airport to reunite with her family. Now, as she stepped into the airport with the FBI agents at her side, she wore an FBI baseball cap and ran into her mother's arms. As they hugged, they both began to cry and her mother told reporters that Jessica was weary. She was a 13 year old baby and she wasn't meant for this kind of hell. But Monica said that for her, it was pure ecstasy because they had waited so long for this nightmare to be done and they were waiting for a miracle to happen. Yet she was also instantly worried for Jessica because Monica knew that this wasn't the end for her. And Monica began to worry that the evidence wouldn't be handled well and that Jessica would need so much healing in the midst of all of this. Some were even theorizing and printing in the media and talking about through gossip that Jessica had gone with this man willingly. But when Jessica was ready to tell her story, investigators listened closely. 
Jessica told them that she did believe she was going to see this publisher and she was excited. Her father and stepmother had allowed her to go. So she was told they were going to Madison, Wisconsin to the Random House Publishing headquarters. She had packed CDs, a t-shirt, a pair of pants, and a swimsuit, and they left at 7 a.m. when her family was still asleep. On the way, she fell asleep in the car, and when she woke up, she immediately knew she was in danger, even more than she knew she was with this man already, because she was bound by her feet and her hands. Stephen suddenly said to her, you are no longer Jessica. Your name is Cindy Johnson. My name is David Johnson. I'm your father. If anyone asks why you look so sad, it's because your mother and twin brother recently died in a car accident. She then asked him if she was ever going home, and he said no, and then admitted that there was no book deal. At this point, Jessica said there was not much she could do. Stephen continued to tell her that her family would be killed if she didn't do as he said, and she decided that she would rather be hurt than her brothers or her parents be hurt instead. He threatened me all the time with, I'm gonna kill your parents, and I'm gonna kill your siblings if you ever say anything. So they drove all the way to the Kansas City airport where Jessica was forced inside by a knife to her back. They then headed for Houston, Texas under the name Cindy and David Johnson. Now, although that scenario may seem impossible today with a knife, with them using different names, back in 1995, it could technically work to fly under a different name. There was also no Amber Alert and no internet posts that could have been shared to get this alert basically out quicker that Jessica was missing. So the security nor flight attendants in Kansas City had any idea that she was a missing girl who was being forced on this airplane. They made it to Houston. They checked into a Best Western motel and Jessica's hair was cut and dyed black. And then Stephen rewired the room phone so she wouldn't be able to use it. Stephen had also made sure that it was a room with a key that locked from the outside so she could be locked in and not have a way out. She was physically, sexually, mentally, and emotionally abused every single day. And if she didn't do what he said, she would be tied to the bed and left there all day. Jessica was shown sexually explicit content and told that she had to do it exactly like it. She was also told that food was a privilege that she had to earn. She was struck so many times in the face and was also stabbed in the stomach with a knife and was unable to get medical attention. She had to bandage it up herself. She was told that no one was looking for her, that her family did not love her, and that she was so ugly that no one would ever date her. She was left alone in the room while Stephen would go to work, but there was nothing she could do. She was either tied to the bed, locked in the room, or in so much pain she couldn't even move. She did try to use the phone to call for help several times, but because it was rewired, the numbers were all wrong and she could never actually reach her home. Eventually, she fell into this life of living as Cindy Johnson, and the memories that Stephen would make up and make her believe started to become even more realistic, and she just became Cindy. Then Stephen spotted a license plate that was from the Midwest area, and he began to panic, so he moved them to the Houston Days Inn, and with little money, Stephen then forced Jessica into sex work. This was while he watched, but this was also where he would be arrested. Yet when the FBI pounded on the door, they got inside. Jessica told them that her name was Cindy Johnson and the man was her father, and she truly believed it. The FBI agent told her, your name is Jessica, Jessica Mullenberg, but she still didn't believe him. They ended up showing her family photos and she started to come back to herself, but only a little bit. And Jessica said that it wasn't until her mother said her real name at the airport that she officially snapped out of it. After being checked out of the hospital, it was found that she would need 13 surgeries on her jaw, but the emotional trauma would take much longer to heal. Almost every day I was either raped or I was hit almost every day if for some reason I didn't complete a sexual act that he wanted done a certain way I would spend the entire day chained or tied to the bed. She used to be very upbeat and loving child to be around and happy and now you can tell that she's depressed and um, day-to-day -day life is hard. Nightmares all the time. And I still have triggers, like when I see a 
a kid is missing, I'm a student pollster, you know, that triggers me back to when I was kidnapped. Inside the room where Jessica was found, the sheets and her underwear were collected with semen on them. And the FBI had realized that the reason for the sudden abduction was that Stephen was about to be arrested for wire fraud. And he knew that he needed to get out of town, but he wasn't going to leave her behind. However, after three and a half months, they theorized that Stephen was getting tired of Jessica. She was maturing and becoming no longer his type. And so... It was theorized that she was close to being abandoned or killed because Stephen at this point just wanted to get back to his real life. Now Jessica was cleared to go back to school. She wanted to go back pretty quickly because she wanted it to give her some sort of normalcy. Her classmates had banners and decorations and she was going back to public school not just for education but in hopes of reuniting with friends and teachers. However, this joy wouldn't last very long and many of the kids began to bully her, asking why she didn't just try to get away or run away. And it would take the teachers in her school talking to her every single day, encouraging her for her to get through high school. And they encouraged her to not let Oliver take her life away more than he already did. Yet the bullying did continue and Jessica would call this portion of her life a nightmare just as the abduction had been. I'm trying to go forward, but there's always the Jessica Melberg who was kidnapped. I got ridiculed from junior high to high school to college, and still today, of, you know, why didn't you run? Why didn't you get away? I mean, they don't know what it's like to be in our shoes and to be kidnapped and traumatized. Now, Stephen spoke to reporters while he was awaiting trial, saying that he hoped that the inmates would kill him right away and that he did not want to be in prison for the rest of his life. He said that he was ca being called a baby raper and that he loved this girl as he would love his own child. At trial, Stephen was being charged with kidnapping and violating the Mann Act. And the Mann Act of 1910 is also the White Slave Traffic Act that criminalizes the transportation of any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution or any other immoral purpose. It was designed to prevent human trafficking. But Stephen would claim that Jessica was this runaway and he was only helping her escape from an abusive family member. But DNA tests showed that the semen on the sheets and her underwear were Stephen Oliver's. Stephen claimed that the semen stains were not because of intercourse. But Jessica then took the stand to tell her side of the story and she bravely stood in front of her abuser and spoke about what he had done for hours. Stephen still refused to take responsibility, saying, I'm not a pedophile, I'm not a child molester, I'm not some kind of fruitcake, but I'm crazy for ending up here. He was sentenced to 480 months for kidnapping and 120 months for the Man Act violation, which meant that he would get 40 years in prison without parole. But Jessica didn't believe that his sentence was harsh enough and said that she wishes that they had the death penalty in Wisconsin. But it turned out that Jessica's abuse hadn't actually started with Stephen Oliver. It had started much younger when she was only five years old. She was abused by two other men. One was her dad's girlfriend's father who would often babysit her and also a friend and roommate of her dad's who was there a lot when she was. But when Jessica told the FBI about these two men, they were also arrested and convicted as well. But for Jessica, a conviction would not change the memories that she had to live with for the rest of her life. Her family refused to say her abductor's name because they didn't want to give him any more attention. They didn't want to trigger Jessica. And she had nightmares all of the time. She can't fly in a plane or stay in a motel or smell coffee because it all reminds her of the abduction. After high school, she graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a major in psychology and minors in criminal justice, law enforcement, and sociology, and she graduated with honors. She said that her main motivation came from people who said that she couldn't do it and that kidnapped victims often didn't even graduate high school. But Jessica was not going to let Oliver win. Jessica began speaking to schools about sexual abuse and what to do if they're in that situation and she wants to do whatever she can to prevent boys and girls from becoming victims. However, certain parts of her trauma snuck up on her without her knowledge throughout her life and she tried to get a job as a school liaison officer 
but was then denied because her psyche eval showed that she had PTSD. Jessica was angry at this because she had already lost her childhood, her friendships, her relationships due to this man, and now she was losing jobs. She did get into an abusive relationship as she got older because for her, that sort of violence was normal, but thankfully she did eventually leave and figured out that she deserved a healthy relationship. Jessica might have survived this, but her trauma could never be taken back. And like she has said, it's like I lived two lives. That's how it's been since I was returned at 13. There's always the Mullenberg, who is the kidnapped part. And then there's the other one where, you know, I finished college and I'm working and I'm trying to go forward, but everything is being pushed back because of the kidnapping. So even though he's in jail, he still controls my life because I can't go forward. Then she met a man called Kurt Christensen who became her friend and then her husband. And she was told after her abuse that there was a three to 5% chance that she could have children. But together they have had two children, Preston and Piper, and she is known to be the best, most protective mother there is but she continues to have anxiety about their safety, refusing to let them live on the ground floor because somebody could get in to them through their window. So she gave up the master bedroom so they could live up there. And she doesn't write her kids' names on the outside of their backpacks because that way, you know, people can't call out their name and they think that they know them and end up going with them. Jessica doesn't let Piper or Preston play outside unattended and is always right there when the school bus arrives. She has told her kids as they've gotten older that she was taken by a bad man and that's why you know they can't go running off and they can't just go play hide and seek without her knowledge and she always needs to know where they are. Both the kids know their addresses and their phone numbers and she doesn't really want to let them go to sleepovers. It's hard to let them go because she knows what happened to her when she would be allowed to go to those sleepovers. But then one of her worst fears came true when Piper didn't make it home from school one day and the bus attendant said that she was never on the bus. Jessica began to panic and so Preston was panicking as well. They were both sobbing and they called Monica for help. Jessica was saying that she knew someone had taken her daughter but thankfully Piper was found at a Halloween school event that Jessica had simply forgotten about. And although for every parent that would be scary that could be triggering for Jessica. It's a whole different level of fear. And Jessica still actually has the side effects of the abuse today. And although she's had 13 surgeries on her jaw, she was hit so much that the bones never fully developed. And so they started to deteriorate. She also suffers from fibromyalgia, which makes it hard to walk sometimes as well. She works at McDonald's at a water aerobics class and helps out her mom with her in-home daycare just to stay busy. She says that she doesn't stop moving until she crashes for the night to keep her from thinking about what happened to her. Monica is so proud of the caring and strong person that Jessica has become, but she's also angry that Jessica continues to have to go through these hard things. Jessica has said she does not think of herself as a strong person, but her mother says that she became even stronger when she had kids. And although Jessica still suffers from many things having to do with the kidnapping, it does not stop her from holding different interviews to share her story and raise awareness. She says, if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Her mother says that they continue speaking out because they will never be able to repay the debt of what everybody did for them when Jessica was missing. But in 2013, Stephen was back in the news because two prison guards had been arrested for letting an inmate assault him. You see, three Three different inmates were in this transport van, including Stephen Oliver, going to a state prison when another prisoner took metal shackles and attacked the other two. Jamie Massey choked Corey Simmons and struck Stephen Oliver several times. The officers didn't stop or report the attack at all, but Stephen did survive, and that's all that's known about him and his time in prison thus far. In 2019, when Jamie Kloss went missing for 88 days and then was found alive, Monica did reach out to her family to talk to them, saying that it gets better every single day, that they will slowly begin to heal, and she offered to meet them in person if they need someone to talk to. But why in the world do you think that Jessica's father and stepmother allowed her to go with this man even though her mother had explicitly told them to keep her away? Was Stephen using a different name? Did they not put the two things together or did they simply not care? I think it says a lot that before the age of five, 
she was already being abused. She was not being looked after and cared for as she should have been. But is that because of neglectful parents or is that because of the time period when many families were not as aware of things that were happening and they were much more relaxed and used to just letting their children do whatever. I know that I was born in 1996 and my mother would not have let me go over to different people's houses without knowing them, but of course there are many different communities that think of things differently, especially back then. And how did nobody at that school realize that this man was targeting this little girl? It seemed to me like he only went to Jessica. He went to recess and followed her around until he cornered her. Somebody had to have seen something. And I think a lot of people in this case kept their mouth shut when they should have been screaming from the rooftops that this man was a monster that he had something very wrong with him. Don't forget the exclusive link to Pinecone is in my description. But don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.